Okay. So now let's go to the third topic. Uh, we decide to do it a little bit different and uh, stand up and try to engage you guys. So my name is uh, Leonidas Alexopoulos and I'm assistant professor at the National Technical University of Athens. I was also lucky enough to be in Boston for several years and uh, I moved back to, to Greece five years ago. Uh, I'm, I used to be like a nerd, I used to be like the researcher that's spending a lot of hours in the lab. I like research a lot, but also in the last three years we started a company in the area of uh, biomarker discovery. But now we're going to stop talking about like investment and trying to have like the background of uh, Dimitris in the, in the area of engineering and management and uh, discuss about how we can apply uh, and start a company in the area of digital health. So, Dimitri, would you like to talk also about yourself, your sure, background? Sure, no problem. And, uh, Thanks. Hello, everyone. Nice to see everybody here. Not very upbeat, a little bit mm, tired, but it's okay. Who cares about digital health? Ah, okay. okay. We have 75% representation. What if I told you that digital health could uh, improve your chances of not having a heart attack by 50%. Would the rest of you care? What if I told you it could uh, decrease your insurance premium by 50%? Would you care? <laughs> Good. Good man. We turn one around. All right. Um, so uh, my name is Dimitris Brillis. I am the uh, general manager for Alcon Greece Cluster. Uh, I manage uh, eight countries for a, a division of Novartis called Alcon. We are the leading uh, player in ophthalmology. We have medical devices, we have pharmaceuticals, and we have consumer goods, contact lenses. So I experience a lot of the different fields that we talk about today. And uh, it's actually the reason why I got interested to join Alcon. Before uh, I joined Alcon in my current role, uh, I was director of uh, corporate strategy for Novartis. So I was based in Basel, big pharma. It looks kind of scary, actually. It's a big, uh, big campus, very, very intimidating, but very exciting. We have a tremendous learning campus in Basel, where we have uh, about 14,000 associates uh, working and thinking a lot about the stuff we just discussed. And uh, under that role, I was uh, sitting kind of above divisions. We have three divisions. We have Novartis Pharmaceuticals, we call it Pharma. We have Alcon and we have Sandoz that uh, focuses on uh, generics and biosimilars. And uh, I did a lot of work on thinking about the future, thinking about where the industry is headed, what is important, uh, and what is eventually going to save more lives and meet more patient needs. Uh, my background, uh, as Leonida said, is uh, Electrical engineering. I have two degrees in electrical engineering. I worked for uh, three years in the software internet business in Austin, Texas. I did all of my training in the US. Uh, I did a bit of, uh, of uh, internet startup type of work in Austin, Texas in the late uh, 90s in the internet bubble. Um, then uh, I decided to uh, to sell my soul to the devil and have a business degree, so I took away the, the science part of my background, uh, but actually built on it. Uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do for a while, so people that usually don't know what they want to do and they have a business degree, they usually go into a management consulting company. So I worked for the Boston Consulting Group for several years, based out of here, Athens, uh, doing a lot of projects in Southeastern Europe and eventually discovered that I am madly in love with healthcare uh, and hospitals. I worked for a hospital group for, for a couple of years uh, before uh, joining Big Pharma. I first worked for AstraZeneca and then joined Novartis um, almost uh, four years ago uh, in uh, the global role in, in Basel. So, digital health. What yeah. is digital health? This is the first question I was planning to, uh, <laughs> to ask. So, so, digital health doesn't really have a definition. I would say digital health is the convergence of digital technologies with genetics and healthcare overall, well-being. 
Uh, it includes anything from a mobile phone to a wearable device, to sensors on the body, around the body, far away from the body. It includes software. It includes big data. It includes a lot of things. I would say the most important thing about uh, digital technologies and digital, digital health is its objective. And, and for me, the objective of digital health is very simple. The objective of digital health is to improve the way we diagnose, manage, and treat health. It's as simple as that. And this is what it's going to do. It has already started. Uh, it has been uh, exploding in the past very few years. As it was mentioned uh, just before, uh, nobody had a smartphone till maybe six or seven years ago. Now you can imagine yourself without a smartphone. In fact, I just did a search just before I, I came up here on health in my uh, iPhone application store, and I got more than 100,000 uh, um, applications. So it's really booming, it's skyrocketing, and it's it's very exciting. It has a lot of applications and is going to significantly transform the way healthcare works and achieves its objective of improving uh, health for people. So it's more or less also what uh, Ari said at the very beginning. So it's, it's a way to empower now the patient to take an action. And it's not like as it was like 10 years ago that you go to the doctor and the doctor was the big king and he was deciding exactly what to do. But now you have the action in your hands, you can read the, the website, you can go to social media, you can find your way around, and you can be more knowledgeable from your like applications, on your iPhone, from your wearables, you can, you can be more knowledgeable for a better well-being. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I like to, um, to use an analog I've heard once and it really stuck with me, which was about cars. The first cars that came out was, a, was a, just a machine with a gas pedal and a steering wheel, if you were lucky. Uh, then there was a speedometer on, on the car, there was a rev meter on the car, then we wanted to measure the battery, then we wanted to measure the temperature. And you fast forward today and you look at cars and, and you have this completely automated system where you want to go from point A to point B, and you can set where you want to go, uh, and this machine will calculate how to get you there, update you on the way if you are achieving your goal, how long it's going to take you to get there, how fast, you, uh, how fast you're going to get there, if you need to reroute because something happened on the way and there was an accident and you need to reroute. For me, digital health will do exactly the same in health. You're going to be able to set a goal, understand that goal, and it's going to help you navigate through the path to achieve that goal, which is, which is improved health. So we're going to be able to monitor how our body is doing, how it's reacting to treatment, whether it needs adjustment, uh, what can we add to that, interact with the physician. It's, not, it's no longer a, a one-stop a one experience. It's an ongoing, it's an ongoing path. Uh, when, I, when I first moved to, to the U.S. to study, actually, I studied in the uh, University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Everybody tells me, so MIT? No, no. It's at my University of Massachusetts in Amherst, which is one hour away from Boston. And back then, we didn't have GPS. So we got out of the uh, Logan Airport with my father and we got into a rental car and wanted to get to Amherst, but we didn't have this. So I stopped in Boston because we didn't get to the freeway. I stopped and, and asked some, a gentleman there about the, uh, how to get to the main highway to get to Amherst. And so I said, sorry, I'm trying to get to Amherst. How can I do that? He says, oh, it's very easy. You just take Mass Ave, Hav Ave, Com Ave, and you're there. <laughs> and I think, what? A, what? <laughs> um, but that's really the experience we have with getting treatment these days. You go to a doctor's visit. You have one shot. He blurbs a, a number of things half of which you don't understand. And then you go off thinking, how am I going to get there? What am I going to do? Well, all that is going to be in the past as soon as all of these digital technologies really come into effect and really transform the way we are treating. But one point I wanted to, to make was, 
Of course, it's always about the patient. But digital health is not only about the patient. Digital health is affecting a lot of stakeholders in the healthcare system. And many times, we all only think about drug discovery. But in fact, all of our treatments, all of our products, they have to be reimbursed. They have to be prescribed. They have to be in a protocol. So there's a lot of stakeholders that are impacted on this. And there are many applications and business opportunities to come in and innovate in the different parts of the, of the value chain and the stakeholders, uh, which maybe yeah. we can elaborate a bit Maybe more. before I ask you, I have a lot of questions. And digital health is actually for engineers. If you're, how many of here are engineers? OK, we have a few engineers. I was an engineer. I'm a mechanical engineer. When I started, I had no idea what is a cell and what is a nucleus in the cell. What, uh, so digital health is the first thing that the engineer can do if he wants to be involved with the bio uh, area. So are there any questions uh, for Dimitris before I ask him something else? Does anyone of the engineers here wants to ask something? How he starts his career, how he can start his career? On? Yes. That was one of my questions later on. Okay, you helped me out. <laughs> okay, so um, great question. The question is, what are the prospects in Greece? They're great. Um, I agree 100%. So, look, it, it really depends on, on somebody's perspective and mindset. Okay? Um, we in Greece um, we're spending, just before the crisis, about $6 billion a year on healthcare. $6 billion on healthcare. That's a lot of money. Some of that money is going to go to innovation. Some of that money is going to go to technologies that can help us save money. So, for example, um, we talked about digital health. So, digital health starts from the, from the patient and eventually ends up to the patient. So. In, uh, in a patient is wearing a watch, has a prescription, sends this to the, to the doctor, and this information gets deducted to a higher level. You can do a macro study. You can even do clinical trials using digital technologies. Then you can get to a higher level where you can do uh, population cost analysis and see what are the right treatments, adjust protocols, evolve the protocols, understand what you should reimburse, when you should reimburse, how you should reimburse. All of these are commercial applications, if you will, of digital health, which go beyond the patient that have a lot of opportunities. And in Greece, we will have to do those things. We will have to build real-world evidence, because real-world evidence is what we should be spending our money on, real-world outcomes. Are we paying the right treatments for the right patients? Soon enough, maybe in Greece is not next year, and in the US, it's already this year. Maybe it's five years from now. Maybe it's eight years from now. But it's not decades. We'll be able to have this real world evidence. Who's going to analyze that? Who's going to tra tra translate that into results and, and conclusions and interact with the payers, the doctors, the, the, the medical associations, etc.? There's a lot of applications beyond the pure initial discovery of a new technology that we can do can really transform the way healthcare works, also in Greece. Especially for the digital health, it's not like the pharma that you're going to need like 20 million euros to start your business. If it's like a big data analytics, you don't need this funding. And they, here, you can find a lot of bright minds, a lot of them. I mean, I have spent a lot of years in Boston. Of course, there are great minds there. But these great minds can cost like 100 to 100K. So, and if you're going to open a, a job in Boston, you're not going to have so many people applying for this job. Starting something here in Greece, and I have seen that uh, with the company that we started, it's much easier in terms of getting very, very high quality of uh, human capital. And uh, especially for the digital health also, is that you don't require that much uh, uh, fund. If, if I can give a very specific example, we, we uh, use a, a lot of scientists here in Greece for our clinical trials. So we interact with the University of Athens, the University of Thessaloniki, uh, some private centers for our devices. We do a lot of research in Greece. And all of these scientists need other scientists next to them to help them go even further, bring more ideas, find ways to, to improve the, the practice, especially for the medical devices part of our business, 
but also for, for pharmaceuticals. I was very recently talking to one of the professors in Northern Greece who was doing a clinical trial for one of our products, and he was telling me how great would it be if we could have an application where in the islands that are remote and don't have access to big hospitals, we could diagnose remotely the disease and be able to bring them into the center when needed so that we don't wait for three years for them to understand that they're developing a cataract, that they're developing some other kind of, of, of disease. So, you know, one of the things I learned in business school about entrepreneurship was that for every idea that succeeds, there was a hundred out there. And maybe the, my colleagues from Venture Capital can tell me the right stats, but there is no one bright idea that you need to keep safe in your head and, and wait until the big uh, aha moment happens. Go out there, network, talk to uh, the, the medical professionals, the centers that do clinical trials, that do research, talk to companies, it doesn't hurt. Uh, we can help uh, with ideas and, and find ways to, to, to get into the space. Yeah, there is one more question. I, I am an engineer myself, and I see this discussion why technology has an enabling technology to what you do. And who's doing the innovation here? I mean, it looks like the one that's finding the innovative scenario is not an invention. It's somebody from the health. It's somebody. So it looks like three engineers uh, know that the, our technologies are applicable, and we have good technology that make the applications work. But who has the business idea? Because now we're talking about the business idea again. Business innovation, not technological innovation. Yeah. So I'm going to repeat the questions just for a little bit. Pharma is deep. Go in and search for the technology with the right structure. Whereas here, you say, you know, you tell me what you want to design, I can do it. You want to do data analytics. You know, I can do very nice data analytics with you. So, if, if I can paraphrase so that everybody can hear you, it's a very good question, is who is innovating in what we are discussing? It includes various components. It includes a life science innovation, which is probably deeper is the word you, you, you talked about in pharma, much more complex. You have the uh, business innovation, and you have the technological innovation that can, that can also facilitate the innovation. Well, my humble opinion is it's all, all of the above. You cannot have innovation without having a business innovation behind it because you need to, somebody to fund it. You also need the, maybe the life science innovation, the medical innovation to go together with the technology. Uh, and, and you may even partner with a big pharma. It's, it's not mutually exclusive. I would say it's very collaborative. So I give you an example. Uh, the example is uh, one year ago Novartis announced partnership with Google. Google was developing technologies for, for the eyes, lenses. And uh, they, they discovered along the way that they would like to find a partner from the life sciences part. So the engineers talked to the life sciences guys to, to look at what can we do. And so currently we're doing a project, this is not uh, confidential, it's pretty well known in the market, about glucose senses, sensing lenses. So we're gonna get very uh, small miniaturized technologies, engineering, uh, that will be sensing uh, glucose in the tears of the eye to be able to tell you what's the glucose level all throughout the day and transmit that to a device and get it out to your doctor. So it's a combination of all of these things and then you can think about, okay, that part is self-standing part Then how do you bring it into the healthcare system in every country? And there you can have a lot more applications that people can be involved in beyond the corporate centers of research and development of, of Google and now. I, I just want, yeah, I just want to add one more, more thing as an engineer. Uh, don't wait, don't expect from the other to come and tell you like, oh, I have this great idea how I can do it. As an engineer, I was a pure mechanical engineer. As I said, I had no idea what the, the other side of the biotech industry is. The one thing that opened my eyes is to go and ask and do interdisciplinary research. Skip your area, your comfort zone of engineering, imaging, uh, computer, machine learning, whatever is this, and try to bug other people and tell them, ask them, what's your problems? What problems you're facing in your everyday life? Try to learn biology or try to learn how a surgeon do the surgery, how an ophthalmologist uh, is putting contact lenses. 
So try to search all this vast space of uh, research and try to learn a little bit of the other side and suggest also your own ideas. So, and this is something that I can see when uh, engineers collaborate with doctors, biologists, and you need feedback from everybody else. But don't stay in your comfort zone. That's the... uh, any other uh, questions? I'm engineers, right? The question is, uh, who pays for the digital health? That's a great, that's a great question. Um, I think the, the people who pay now uh, are very different than the people who will be paying in a few years from now. Uh, because of the early stage of where it is and, and the fact that uh, a lot of the digital health, especially around the M Health, is, is for free or is coming as an accompanying tool to some other technology or, or a medicine. Um, a couple of years ago, I was involved in, the, in, a, in work on predicting where the healthcare industry is moving to. And uh, what we saw was that in the next 10 years, let's say, uh, there's going to be 1 billion more people on this planet. Um, out of this 1 billion people, half of it, 500 million, will be above the age of 50, uh, which are the ones that are really burdening healthcare systems. Uh, and, and in fact, 70% uh, of the disease burden will be chronic diseases, the ones we already know, cardiovascular, respiratory, and, and, and the likes. This is going to make the global healthcare spend exceed 15, 15 trillion dollars a year. As you can imagine, uh, a lot of the healthcare systems around the world cannot afford this. Why they can afford this? Because they're already spending a lot of money. Some of the uh, developed countries are already spending too much, uh, like the US, spending close to 20% of its GDP. Some of the countries are starting from a very low base, so they have to spend a lot of money to catch up. Uh, last I checked in China, maybe three years ago, they were spending $180 or so per capita per person really low so one dollar per person to increase it is one billion dollars so there's a lot of money that needs to be saved and therefore how are we going to be able to save that money well we believe at Novartis that the way we're going to be able to save that, that, that money uh, is to efficiently allocate our resources and how are we going to do that by paying and rewarding outcomes I think you mentioned it earlier in, in your in your presentation I was very happy to see that that the world is going to move into a place where you're not just uh, rewarding a pill, a device, an implant, but you're going to be rewarding the actual improvement in your health and the overall efficient reduction of the cost of the treatment to the, to the healthcare system. So once this becomes more institutionalized, because now it's still very much uh, um, lone wolf type of efforts, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of money for this. And uh, this could also have a big impact on how the pie is redistributed. It was very interesting. Two years ago, I was in a conference like this one in, in Pennsylvania, in the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, when, when, when you were hearing the panelists in, the, in this US environment, everybody was thinking, big pharma is done, small uh, med tech companies are going to change the way we operate and completely revolutionize. Now, I don't know whether it's going to go this way or another. I think going to be a combination of the two and as long as you have real medical innovation you will always be rewarded for it uh, but the money is there it's just a matter of finding ways to translate that into value for in healthcare and, and then allocating to the right uh, to the right resources in one last oh, okay. yeah can you The question is about big data, how to control them, analyze them. That's a tough question. Big data and controlling are two very difficult things to combine. Huh? Um, I, will tr I will try to stay away of the ethical aspect of this topic because there's a lot of uh, dimensions to this. 
And the are we ready? I will not uh, talk about Greece, I will talk about globally. Um, we are really getting there. Uh, maybe a couple of years ago you heard or read about Watson Health. IBM uh, has this uh, technology called the Watson Supercomputer, the one that can win in Jeopardy and uh, beat Kasparov in chess and all that stuff by applying machine learning into decision making. So they took this technology and they put it into a unit called Watson Health. They, they bought a company called Exploris, which has access to 50 million patient records in the US, uh, I think from the Cleveland Clinic. And they also bought a company from, uh, called Fitel that does disease management. And they want to put all of this together and start taking disease by disease and analyze, well, what are the different disease patterns? Which treatments are working? How should you best treat your health and be able to coach and manage patients towards doing this optimized uh, treatment? So is it going to work? Absolutely. How fast? We'll see, but it's already working in many places. And there are several companies. Google is into this as well. All the big pharma companies are looking into it. Medical devices companies are looking into it. And you can bet that in, uh, in just a matter of just a few years, the way the industry works and gets funded is going to be completely different than what it is today. And also, if you take into uh, your mind that how much big data we have now compared to how much we had a few years ago, the explosion of genomics, proteomics, sequencing, there is going to be huge demand of big data analysts in the future. And something that you can do also being in Greece with uh, having a lot of advantages. Also, there are, of course, some disadvantages, but big data is one area that uh, Greece can flourish and can have startup companies in this area. Any other questions? I think we are running out of time. One, one more, one last question from Vasilis. Um, the, uh, biotech and medical devices are uh, supporting uh, the medical professionals, doctors essentially, so they've, uh, they were, uh, the, the doctors love them because they enable them to do better their work. Um, digital health uh, implies that they, as consumer, as patient, you can mediate uh, a tendency. Uh, to have problems. In the States, there was a lot of discussion about who can see the records and everything. There's a very interesting book uh, called Creative Destruction of Medicine. Do you see that doctors are getting in the way of uh, I, I am allowing the potential of digital health growing? That's a good question. Um, let me start by, by saying I was, I was reading an, uh, an article on digital health as I was thinking about today's presentation and uh, it was talking about the effectiveness of apps when downloaded from the app store versus prescribed from the doctor. And I don't remember the exact number but the effectiveness of the app having a positive impact on the outcome of the patient was significantly higher when it was prescribed by the physician. Uh, another personal anecdote I can share is whenever there's been a health issue in my family, uh, myself, my children, my parents, and I looked at the internet, I freaked out. I thought, I thought that was it. We were doomed. Because, uh, you know, you don't have, the, um, you don't have the, uh, the scientific background to be able to judge uh, and tell between uh, symptoms and the clinical history, etc. Maybe decades, hundreds of years from now, uh, doctors uh, will be disintermediated from a big part of the value chain. Maybe, I don't know. But I think for the, for the foreseeable future, they're going to be an integral part of healthcare provision. It's just going to be able to be much more effective because they're going to be complemented with a lot more technologies and tools that are going to help them understand the, the path of the patient. So think about it. Usually when we enter a doctor's office, the doctor has one pulse of your life. What it looks like that moment. They don't know what you did before. They don't know what you will do after. It's only that moment. And usually, it's during a critical moment. We also do the checkups. But I mean, you've been to a checkup. Um, it's not that impressive. So it's usually when you have a problem that you go for the intervention. And so if a doctor can, can bring in a history, a background, genetic profile, a lifestyle profile, a 
and make decisions based on that, it's going to be much more effective. Will there be a day when all of these will be um, understood by a machine and, and, and give back a recommendation that the doctor or somebody else will be able to assess and, and, and provide to the patient? Maybe. But I think that's a bit further out. What I'm particularly excited about is all of the technologies that are now here. This, this thing can track a lot of my information that's on me that if I could download to a, to a doctor's office, they could help them make a much better decision and still be part of the decision. Okay, let's thank uh, one more time. Uh,